I'm Pastor Jeremy. Thank you for being here today at the start of a new series. Today is a series we call Center, and it's the Lent series. Even though we've been in Lent for a week and a half, which I know you all know because you've been following our calendar, right? You've been following the calendar of giving something up every single day. And today is 10 cents for every cup, every drink that's not water, right? So for all of you who had your 15 cups of coffee this morning, that's $1.50 dollar fifty. It's going to get donated. <laughs> it starts with water. It does start with water. I tried this argument, and then I got put on Facebook for uh, not being successful. So uh, I just invite you to do it because uh, this, there's a reason that we do stuff like this, and it's to remind us of the season that we are in. And it's the season of Lent, which is the season before Easter, which is the greatest holiday in the church. Right, Christmas is pretty special, but Easter is better because Easter is when we celebrate that Christ rose from the grave. All right? And so Lent is the preparation for that season or for that holiday. So we have this quote that we started. It's at the center of every step of activity in God's plan stands Jesus. All right? At the center of every step of God's plan stands Jesus. And for us, Jesus says we can't go to the Father except through him, right? So Jesus is a pretty important person. <laughs> he is part of the Trinity, so he is God, but he, he's a big deal. And so this whole series is about Jesus, and we're going to ask these three questions during the, se- the, the series. First is, why did Jesus come? Why did he come? That's what we're going to be looking at every Sunday. What did he do while he was here? And then what are we supposed to do in response to that? So our three questions, why did Jesus come, what did Jesus do, and what are we to do? Because we're part of this whole thing, too. We're not just supposed to sit back and and, and do nothing. We are supposed to participate in this journey. And so this isn't the why here, but we're going to ask, why did Jesus come? Why did he come to this world? Because of sin. Because in the beginning, when everything was perfect, man decided to not be perfect and decided to take things into his own hand and sin entered the world. We know the story, right? The, the Adam and Eve are tempted and they eat some fruit because they want to know good from evil and they want to be like God. And so sin is in this world and it's something that we struggle with all the time. So Jesus comes, Jesus comes after uh, a few thousand years, two thousand years and, and says, uh, well more than that I should say, lots of years, and and comes and dies for our sins, past, present, and future. That's why Jesus comes. So it's pretty cool. You know, Jesus is a big deal. I'm going to say it a billion times. Jesus is a big deal. But he starts out his journey being baptized, like many of us start out our journey as a Christian, is they're baptized. So if you want to turn with me to Mark chapter 1, we're going to be in Mark and Luke, so you can get those ready. Or it's on, it should be on the Bible app uh, if you check this morning at 10, it probably wasn't there because I forgot to do it, and now it's there. So you can check the Bible app for the events. If not, Mark chapter 1. John the Baptist prepares the way. Verse 4. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. We talked about this a couple of series ago. John the Baptist is preparing the way for Jesus. Right, Jesus is the one who's, uh, who baptizes with the Holy Spirit and frees us from our sins. So John the Baptist is preaching this message. And then here comes, here comes Jesus. We're going to look at Luke here for this account. Luke chapter 3, verses thir- uh, chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And he was praying heaven, and as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son with whom I love, with you 
I am well pleased. As others were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. This is a social journey that we are on. It's not individual. I'm going to highlight that again later. But what's really special about this moment, well, first, Jesus is baptized, and we've all been baptized. It's kind of this cool shared experience that we have, right? You know, I was baptized and Jesus was baptized. But it's also a moment that we get to experience and witness, and the people there get to see the Trinity, which is this great mystery. God in three and one, one and three, Father, Son, Holy Ghost is all present right here in this moment. Jesus, the Son of Man, God who walks this earth, the Holy Spirit and the voice of God all in one spot and one moment when Jesus begins his ministry. I just, it's, I can't comprehend that <laughs> because it's just, it's had to be amazing. So Jesus is this powerful moment. Jesus is baptized. All these other people are there as he's being baptized. And then immediately, immediately after he's baptized, he feels like he's called somewhere. At the beginning of chapter 4, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. Baptized, the power of the Trinity in one moment, and he immediately, immediately feels called to go to the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days and not eat anything. Right? So if you think, if you think that, that when you become a Christian, life is easy and it becomes easy to go, <laughs> Jesus himself, when he began his ministry, is tempted for 40 days without eating any food. Now, I don't know if you have gone just one day without eating any food and how miserable and angry you get, uh, but 40 days was with no food. That's what Jesus went through. I would, not be, <laughs> I would not want to be around Jesus. The human side, I'm sure, was not very happy with the God side of Jesus. But 40 days, it's not like the best thing ever. He doesn't go and save the world right away. He doesn't go and knock Jerusalem back to the Christian side and give everybody back to God-focused kingdom work. But he goes and he is tempted for 40 days. 40 days is a long time. 40 days. And I love how it ends here. It says, and he was hungry. <laughs> like, no duh, right? I mean, he was hungry. But in the midst of this, that's important because when you take away the very necessity that we need to survive food, and you're trying to survive, and your body is trying to cope with that, your brain starts to do funny things when you're hungry. And so in that moment, in that weakness, Satan comes and tempts him. The devil comes and tempts him three times. The first temptation he gets is the temptation for food, right? Rightfully so, that you would just attack where you're the weakest probably first. And so right here at the beginning, right after he goes to the wilderness, chapter 4, verses 3, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Jesus is hungry. The Bible says so. And he is tempted with a magic trick to feed himself. And we know this isn't some crazy thing because when the Israelites were walking around the desert, manna fell from the sky. So this is not like a, a thing that's just brand new to us. We are tempted, we are tempted with things all the time. Maybe not food, but things. Things that we usually feel like we cannot live without. Now, I don't know, I don't know everybody's story here, but I, I would uh, believe that many people don't choose to go without food for an extended period of time. Things we can't live without. So, to the people who've never been that hungry, what are some things that you feel like you cannot live without? What are moments in your life where you've just been like, I can't live without this thing? 
Sometimes when we're in a, a pretty good life, those things are inconsequential to other people. Right? I mean, and sometimes we just kind of throw it around flippantly, like I can't live without ESPN, right? So I have to buy my cable package and I can't live without sports. Or uh, I cannot live without the newest iPhone 10 that's out right now or whatever next year's model is going to be. I can't live without it. Sometimes we are tempted with something that our body craves so much because of we we're addicted to it or we've given it up voluntarily. I can give you an example. Uh, I used to be a smoker. And so if you've ever been a smoker, which I, I hope you never do, and kids don't ever start smoking because it's miserable, I quit. I quit when I was uh, in Afghanistan, which is probably a terrible time to quit in the middle of this, this war zone. But my own body was tempting me <laughs> to, to have some nicotine. But my friends weren't the greatest friends during that time either because they don't want to see somebody succeed always not in a bad way, but they just, you know, all my friends went out to smoke. So I either had to go out with them and just resist the temptation or not have a, a friend group anymore. And people tempted me. I like to say I made it through. Amen. Hallelujah. That I, am not, I don't smoke, but this level of temptation that we can get from something that's not good for us can be so overwhelming that we just have no choice but to give in. We have no choice but to give in. And some of you know this if you've ever been on a diet, right? If you've ever given, I'm not going to eat this food, whatever it is. And then your body just goes into panic mode. Like, why would you ever give up chocolate? And then next thing you know, you've got one of those big uh, chocolate boxes from Walgreens, you know, and you've eaten the whole thing. Or a two-pound Hershey's egg. I've never gotten to that, that point yet, but it is tempting to walk by that thing. That's the first temptation. And Jesus says, Jesus says, nope, man shall not live on bread alone. It is written. So we go to the next temptation. This is in verses 5 through 8. The devil led him, Jesus, up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Sometimes it's tempting to just shortcut your way to the kingdom of God. Sometimes it is tempting just to get the checklist of, of things you're supposed to do for a Sunday morning or as a church member and say, I went to church, I gave my 10%, I uh, read my Bible for five minutes, before I went to sleep, uh, I said a, a three-minute prayer where all I did was talk. And it's easy to shortcut what God wants you to do to get this kingdom of heaven that has been promised to us. But the gospel message isn't to check the boxes, right? The gospel message is to go and make disciples of all nations and love your neighbor as yourself and to, and to love the Lord God above all things. And so that's good for church work. But what does this like, look like in our normal world? Well, it, have you ever just wanted something so bad that you would shortcut any sane way to do it to get what you wanted? And I can think of this. Uh, say, for example, you want uh, a brand new computer. <laughs> and you don't have the money for it, and so you, you get it on credit. You're shortcutting the way to get it. Payday loans are a, a result of this temptation. But we can't give in to getting anything but the, God, the life that God has called us to. We can't shortcut our work for the kingdom. We can't shortcut the work that we are called to do for the kingdom. It's good that we came back to this community, right? It's good that we came to East Toledo, but we can't just stop by having a church that meets on Sunday mornings. 
We can't shortcut our way to the kingdom because we feel like we've come to a place where people need Jesus and that we don't introduce people to Jesus. It is not good enough that we just meet on a Sunday morning in this community. It requires us to go and do, and it requires us to seek God's will and God's kingdom above all else. And the worst part is people capitalize on this and try to this day to just to just say this can all be your power, this can all be yours if you just bow down to me. Which I think kind of leads us into our last temptation which is recognition. So if we look at verses 9 through 12 the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. A stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. How is this? How does this have to do with recognition, right? This seems like a safety thing. Like not. Satan seems to be saying, jump off this building and see if God protects you. I think the location is important. It's not just a cliff. It's not just a mountaintop. It is Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem, where is where God resides. Satan says, jump off of here where it's going to be busy and people are going to see you and let's see if God really does what he's going to do, says he's going to do. And then all these people are going to see you get safely down to the ground and will recognize Jesus as the Son of God. How many times does Jesus say, don't tell anybody who I am? <laughs> don't tell anybody who I am yet. I mean, what, do, what does throwing yourself off a tower get you? <laughs> you know, what does it get you? For Jesus, it was the recognition of, of God's power. For me, this is probably my greatest temptation. The question we're going to ask at the end is, what temptation are you most susceptible to? And mine is probably the recognition of, look at me, look what I've done. Pride may be another word for this. But what does seeking recognition get us? It gets us a, a, it gets us a pursuit that might not be the one that God has called us to. It might bring us broken relationships as we break the relationships around us to get to where we need to be because of what we want, not because of what God wants. And it might not seem like we do this that often, but the rise of social media would beg to differ. Right? If you have a Facebook or a Twitter or an Instagram or a Snapchat or a microblog or, God forbid, a MySpace still, you put that post up, right? And you just wait to see the first like. And then you wait to see who's commented on it, and then you wait to see the analytics of who's commenting and who's doing what. And when we seek recognition, selfishly, we are not seeking God's will, but we are seeking our will and our recognition. So that's Jesus' wilderness, right? Jesus' wilderness is. It's 40 days in the desert with Satan tempting him. And we don't all have the luxury to take 40 days off of our job to be tempted by Satan. But we do find ourselves in wildernesses today. Sometimes we're led there just like Jesus was. And remember, Jesus went there because he was led by the Spirit. The Spirit said, go to the wilderness. And Jesus responded and said, yes, a kairos moment for Jesus. Sometimes we are led to the wilderness by the Spirit. That's why we observe this thing in the church calendar called Lent. This 40 days before Easter, we build it into the calendar to take a time that's intentionally set aside to take ourselves away from the world. Most times people give one thing up for about a week and then they can't resist it anymore, right? I mean, some people give up soda for 40 days and then... Or some people give up Facebook, and a week later you see that they have posted something on Facebook or they've liked something that you've posted because you're watching it because you want that recognition. Sometimes we just limit something for whatever reason, and diets are a way that we limit ourselves, and sometimes we just do that for our health. Sometimes we limit 
our couch potato-ness and go work out and run. Or sometimes we limit our schedules by setting aside uh, a night that nobody can touch, etc., etc. But these are all times that we can probably do for selfish reasons. Not very often do we say we're going to set aside this thing for God. We're going to set aside Friday mornings to not eat any food called fasting. It's, a, it's the way we do this is fasting so we can focus on God. Sometimes, sometimes our wildernesses are forced upon us. I recognize that sometimes we just get into a spot that we just look up and we say, where the heck am I? And some of that is we have a crisis of some sort, a death in the family, a death of a loved one. Sometimes it is a community crisis. Sometimes it is we just get busy in life. Sometimes we just don't pick our heads up and we just are following our own footsteps on this path and then we look up and we're in the middle of the desert lost. We neglect our studies, we neglect our prayers, we neglect meeting together as a family, right? We neglect our small groups or church times. In my case, you get deployed to Afghanistan. That was my wilderness. So if you're lucky enough to have the government say that you get to go on a wilderness expedition, you can do that too. But my time in the wilderness was Afghanistan because that was a time I got to get away from everything and I got to focus on God and I got to surround myself with godly men. But what do we do when we find ourselves in the wilderness? Whether we choose to do that ourselves or we choose uh, to pick our heads up and realize that we are in the wilderness, we got to be prepared. We have to be prepared. Jesus was God. So he was pretty prepared. But he had also studied for a long time before he started his ministry at 30. And how does Jesus respond? Jesus doesn't respond with, I'm a strong person, you know, I'm going to... No, he responds with scripture. He says, it is written or it is said. He responds with scripture, the word of God. He responds with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit led him there. And sometimes we have to recognize that we are fallen and we are broken. And sometimes we just need to empty ourselves of everything to be taken over and to be consumed by the Holy Spirit. We have to be in community. <laughs> Christianity, following Christ, following Christ is not a solo endeavor. It is not something that you do by yourself. It is something that you do in a community with other people. So a great way to do that is to start here, come Sunday mornings. We don't come here just to, just to catch up on the latest gossip, but we come here to be in the presence of God and to worship him and to hear what he would have to say, that hopefully I am doing a good job conveying what the message he put on my heart was for you. That's why we come, to hold each other accountable. Small groups are a great way to do this. If you're not in a small group or a Bible study or something, join one. We have two that meet here, two, three. Three that meet at this campus. There are six or seven, I think, that meet at the other campus. And if you can't find a good night or a good time to start one or join one, then start one. We have a Bible study that meets on Sunday mornings right now. Be in a group of uh, believers to hold each other accountable. We sang today, teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. That's my phone, I'm sorry. I, knew, I wondered where it was. We sing today, teach my song to rise you when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. <clears throat> but sometimes we don't know where to fall. <laughs> and when we are by ourselves, all we can do is just fall on the ground. And when you surround yourself with other people, you have other people to catch you as you fall. So please be in community because this is not a solo adventure. Jesus went into the desert and resisted temptation because it was the pathway to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit led him there. He emptied himself. He was tempted. And when it was done, angels came and attended to him. 
So what are, we, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to walk with Jesus into the, de- into the desert, this land. It's a challenge, and it's a wilderness that you are going to be prepared for because I'm asking you to go there right now. It's not one that's going to catch you off guard. If you need a calendar to see what we're doing as a church, I can send that to you. But go to the wilderness so you can empty yourself, so you can be with the Holy Spirit, so we can be and bring hope for this community in East Toledo. So why did Jesus come? He came to walk with us. He came to experience what you experienced. What did Jesus do? He went to the wilderness and he resisted temptation. And so what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to walk with him, even when in wilderness with doubt, discouragement, grief, or struggle. Walk with Jesus, because he's been there. He's been there to the point where he hung on a cross for you and for me and to cleanse the world of all these sins. So as you go through this week and you hear and you respond and you share this whatever God has placed on your heart, the question, the leading question I want you to answer is which temptation are you most susceptible to? Where is Satan going to attack you? Is it going to be your appetite for things? Is it going to be the quest for power? Or is it going to be the quest for recognition and pride? Mine is recognition, and I'm sharing that with you right now. So if I ever get too big for myself, if Carlene hasn't knocked me down five pegs yet, you have the permission to do so. And so we're going to end this message. We're going to pray, and then we're going to sing a song uh, and just and just be in the presence of God and just reach out to him and let him work in your heart and just listen to his voice calling you into the wilderness. So when Easter comes and we celebrate that Jesus has risen from the grave, risen from the dead, it's a celebration time that we are free from our sins. Let's pray. God, we thank you for coming to this earth and walking amongst your creation. We thank you for uh, showing us what it looks like to resist temptation. I pray for, for this congregation and for the people in this room that they hear your voice, whether it's to say, follow me out here into the wilderness, or whether it's to say, I know you're in the wilderness, but I am with you. Fall on me, lean on me. Lord, you're a big God and a mighty God. We love you and we ask this all through Jesus Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.